have moved in on the headquarters of the radical group MOVE, delivering an eviction order. In the vicinity of the MOVE house in West Philadelphia, about a half hour ago, a police helicopter was seen making a low pass over the area, and at the same time, police at the scene were holding their ears. The police had evidently been warned that there would be a loud explosion. Jim, it has been five and a half hours now since that incendiary device was dropped out of that helicopter, and it rages on. There must have been a better way. It's a disaster, Jim. The MOVE organization surfaced in Philadelphia during the early 1970s. Characterized by dreadlock hair, the adopted surname Africa, a principled unity, and an uncompromising commitment to their belief, members practice the teachings of MOVE founder John Africa. The basic teaching of John Africa is, you know, to protect life of, you know, the enslavement of this system. You know, which means all life, which means animals, you know, uh, which means, you know, protect the animal from the, the encagement of zoos, which means protecting, you know, uh, political prisoners from being locked up in prison. You know, our, our work, that's our work. Our work is to free life of the enslavement of this system. Now, when people think of the system, they don't think of a, a, an organization that they're supposed to be fighting. They think of a, a system of some fictitious character that nobody really sees, nobody really knows who it is, right? But the system is all around us. It's everywhere. It's in your churches. It's in your schools. It's, in, it's everywhere. It's, it's up here. It's in your mind. It's in my mind. It's in all of our minds because we have come in contact with it and we are imposed on by that disease. The MOVE organization target is getting rid of the system. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure how long is it going to take for that to happen. You know, I know it's not going to happen overnight. You know, but that's MOVE, you know, goal is to get rid of this system and, you know, like I say, to free life of the system enslavement. Revolution to us is not a bloody battle against the oppressors. Revolution to us means generation. It means to move forward. As long as you're not compromising and you're going forward, then you are victorious. You are only defeated when you stop fighting, when you give up. And that is what MOVE understands. And it is that single principle that is defeating this system. During the early 1970s, MOVE was based in the Powelton Village section of West Philadelphia. They purchased a large Victorian house on 309 North 33rd Street, which became their headquarters. Members valued the personal discipline and physical strength derived from hard manual labor and maintained a hefty work schedule of daily activities such as exercising, running dogs, and chopping firewood. We used to demonstrate against uh, puppy palaces and any any like stores that used to sell life for exploitation, you know, just for for capital gain. We were demonstrating against police brutality. We were demonstrating against the pet stores for and the zoos about their treatment of or mistreatment of animals. Uh, we were doing some work with the neighborhood gangs in terms of. Uh, you know, selling some of those disputes they had out there and, you know, but most of our work was uh, centered on, you know, the liberation of animals and the liberation of people. 
these are the things that was never ever talked about you know in the early days that move was engaged with very productive thing things that are very popular now you know things that are very accepted now you know you even have the green party an environmental party that runs on this but this was nothing that was ever focused on about the move organization Throughout the 1970s, Frank Rizzo was the premier figure in Philadelphia government. He started as a street cop and rose through the ranks, eventually serving as police commissioner from 1967 to 1971. During this time, Rizzo gained notoriety for his tough guy law enforcement tactics and racist attitude. Capitalizing on his name and recognition and tough on crime image, Rizzo mobilized sufficient voters to be elected mayor of the city for two terms from 1972 until 1980. Throughout Rizzo's time as police commissioner and mayor, the Philadelphia police were nationally known for their brutality. The police department in Philadelphia could invade Cuba and win. Saying Tom Snyder is that we are now trained and equipped to fight wars. Is it possible that when a policeman on the beat reads Rizzo said to the Italians break their heads, he says, hey, I can break their heads. Break their heads is right. They try to break yours, you break theirs first. The ones that are responsible, get that death penalty back and put them in the electric chair and I'll pull the switch. That's what I'm sure they'll not be around. kind of ruthlessness to society that I think MOVE was addressing. Um, in fact, they were victims of that ruthlessness, but that was their key issue. The key issue was police brutality. It was a legitimate issue. So they can kill everybody in the South and justify it by using public opinion. For everybody out there to understand that we will not back down for wisdom. MOVE had a good cause, it had good things, good issues, and so forth. But the way they conducted themselves in the public arena was questionable. As a result of MOVE's demonstration strategy, MOVE members were arrested on a regular basis. Confrontation started with authority, and then it wound up that we was going to court, and then the confrontation started with the courts and the judges, and it just snowballed into, you know, uh, one confrontation after other against the system. You have to understand that the MOVE organization had challenged the authority and the jurisdiction of every courtroom that any MOVE member ever stepped in, and they challenged it uh, you know, uh, vigorously and they challenged it from the outset so that the power of the court to hear their case, uh, whatever case there might have been, was always challenged by MOVE, that you don't have authority, you don't have the power to, to hear this case. Um, and it was really a, a very powerful challenge to the power of the state inside the courtroom. MOVE never let the threat of being arrested stop their demonstrations. Yet events soon proved that police harassment wasn't limited to just demonstrations. So on our way they stopped us and just started harassing us and they grabbed us both. Both of us were pregnant, obviously pregnant, and they grabbed us and slammed us against the paddy wagon and arrested us, put us in handcuffs and took us to the station. Well, while we were getting arrested, we was telling they was like trying to break our arms, trying to I mean, like really messing us up. So they handcuffed us, put us in a paddy wagon, and took us to uh, the 50th uh, of the district, 50, I think it was 55th and Pine mm -hmm. District. Anyway, when they got us there, they handcuffed us to wooden chairs, knowing that me and Lee Singh were pregnant. They wouldn't let us go to the bathroom, wouldn't let us make phone calls, and didn't give us anything to eat. As a result of that, both of us suffered miscarriages. On March 28, 1976, seven jailed MOVE members were released from jail late in the evening. Some of our family was being released from prison, and as usual, you know, we greet them. And it was uh, like 2 in the morning, and it was just us out, and it wasn't really loud. It was just family greeting family. And all of a sudden, these cop cars pull up with no lights, no nothing. They just pull up on the street, and the cop car stops in front of the house, the cop comes over and he says that he had a um, report that there was a disturbance, a fight going on. So Chucky 
told them that there's no fight, it's just move people who greet our family home from prison, so you know, go ahead, it's no problem. When he said that, they all come out the car and rush over the street where we're at, and they just start swinging their blackjack. I was standing in front of my husband, Phil Africa, and the cop, to get the pill, he just took me and slammed me on the ground. I had my three-week-old three week son in my arms, and when he slammed me down, he just stomped over me to get the pill, and I don't know how, but the baby's head was crushed. And I just was so upset, I jumped up and I ran back in the house. I don't, I, I must have went in shock because my family just found me in the house holding the baby, and the baby had died. Move immediately contact the media to report the death of Life Africa and displayed a police hat and broken nightstick outside of their headquarters. To prove the death to a skeptical media, Move invited press and politicians over to their headquarters to show them the body of Life Africa. Then I was invited on one Friday evening, a cold, <sighs> blustery, winter evening when they invited people in to see the dead baby and I actually sat in front of the house for an hour debating on whether I would go in or not. And in the end I opted not to go. But no, I didn't see the assault itself, but I did talk to people who did see it, eyewitnesses other than who. And they did say that there was a move woman with a baby uh, who was, you know, wailing on the police just like the police was wailing on them. And uh, they did see the baby knocked down, and they did see a police officer step on the bed. Move then brought the case to court, where many neighbors were willing to testify that they witnessed the attack on Move and the death of Life Africa. But before all the testimony could be heard, Judge Myrna Marshall dismissed the case. Because, you know, Move did not go, they, they did their own birth yeah. uh, in, in house and they didn't register their children with the authorities. And then they uh, ordered Move to produce the corpse of the kid such that they could do an autopsy to determine the cause of death. And Move contended that the, uh, that type of an act was uh, in variance and actually in violation of their religious practices. They didn't go in for uh, autopsies. So because, you know, the bottom line is because MOVE did not produce the baby, the city refused to do an investigation, and that's both the police department and the district attorney's office, who at the time was headed by Ed Rendell. After the death of Life Africa, MOVE was convinced the city was trying to terminate MOVE. The organization felt compelled to arm themselves. On May 20th, 1977, MOVE set up a platform outside the headquarters and began demonstrating. MOVE members stood on the platform demanding the release of MOVE prisoners and demanded an end to the violent city campaign of harassment against MOVE. Due to the demonstration on May 20, 1977, Judge Lynn Abraham issued warrants for 11 MOVE members on charges of riot and possession of an instrument of crime. Finally, we just decided as an organization to take a position, take a position on that platform and let these people know that if they came at us with whatever, with fists, with uh, clubs, with guns, whatever, then we would meet them on equal terms. And that's how the confrontation started. Rizzo filed in court to set up a starvation blockade around MOVE headquarters. The courts approved his request. On March 16, 1978, hundreds of cops set up barricades around MOVE headquarters and shut off their water to starve MOVE out. On April 4, 1978, thousands marched around City Hall in protest of the city's actions. What MOVE wanted was the, to be left alone. They wanted the right to exercise their First, Second, and Fourth Amendment rights. and. Um, they uh, had five or six of their members that were in prison. They didn't want those folks uh, released from prison. Uh, and we, the negotiations went on and back and forth for almost a year. The city wanted moved to vacate.
During the time the arrest warrants for MOVE were given in 1977 up until almost a year later, many negotiators tried to resolve the problem between MOVE and the city. Some people uh, who I was told were Quakers or something had offered them some land out in Chester County. So I asked uh, John Africa, why wouldn't they move out there, you know? And his answer was, why don't the city move? And they said, that's crazy. I say, but that's his answer. Why is this crazy? He's here and he's satisfied where he is, you know, and that's what he said. Why don't the city move? Finally, move was met with an offer they couldn't refuse. All moved prisoners were released on May 8th, and the city agreed to drop all charges that faced move. In the agreement, the city was allowed to search move headquarters for weapons and explosives. While searching move headquarters, the city only found inoperable weapons, dummy firearms, and road flares. After the city realized that MOVE had no real firearms, MOVE claimed that the city began twisting parts of their agreement. The main point that was disputed between MOVE and the city was the 90-day agreement. MOVE claimed that they agreed to the city finding them a new home within a 90-day working timetable. The city claimed that the 90-day agreement was a deadline where MOVE must leave their house or be evicted by the city. I think that the perception was that MOVE would leave, but I must be honest and tell you that it, it, it may not have been as clear as that was clearly stated, right. as that which then left a window of opportunity for either side to, to um, you know, uh, make claims. Right. Yes, he said, we will drag them out by the scruff of their necks. He, he answered that no, question. Wait, wait, wait. Did you ask him what if they don't, what if they resist the scruff of the neck? Did you make him go down in detail to say, well, yeah, if they resist, I'm going to kill them? Did you make him put out his intentions? No. You don't never question Rizzo. And Rizzo is questionable. That man ain't told the truth since he got in office. That man ain't been agreeable since he got the name of mayor. We're saying it's about time that y'all start putting the truth. Don't question the person that's telling the truth, question the person that's telling the lie. We're saying we ain't talking about hurting nobody's religion. We ain't talking about killing off nobody's religion. Rizzo is talking about religion persecution. He talking about putting us in a gas oven. He talking about killing our babies, genocide, like they did the Indians, like they did the Jews. We're saying it's about time that the news media start questioning Rizzo's reference. See? Neighbors' complaints about um, uh, move uh, collecting stray dogs and walking the dogs through the neighborhood, right? And at various hours of the night, uh, they complained about the compost that uh, Move had built in their yard. So this was, first of all, a sympathetic neighborhood. But nonetheless, there was an antagonism between Move and its neighbors that was real. And then I think the other piece was that Move, in terms of its message, uh, would not only take its message to the street, but would have a loudspeaker system on its home. Move was also very in your face from get-go, and that's legitimate. But there's a certain point where the law starts saying that foul language publicly is against the law. And then the, the occupation of the building was also against the law, so there's just provisions for that. On August 2nd, 1978, Judge Fred DeBona ruled that Move had disregarded the 90-day deadline and that they should have vacated the house. During this hearing, DeBona gave the city the power to arrest basically all known adult Move members, including members that weren't in the house. On August 8, 1978, hundreds of cops in flak jackets and riot helmets surrounded MOVE headquarters to carry out Judge DeBona's ruling. They came on August 8th, you know, with bulldozers and tanks and anti-personnel anti carriers and, you know, they assaulted. Forty-five police then entered the MOVE household and searched all three floors of the house, only to find MOVE barricaded in the basement. Around 8 a.m., firemen pried off the boarded windows of the basement and started flooding the basement with water cannons. Twenty-five hundred gallons of water per minute or something like that. You know, it's just some, too much for anybody to stand up. The water that was coming in the basement was so strong, it was taking the bricks off the wall. First it was taking the paint off, it was busting up things, then it was taking the bricks off the wall. Man. It was a consensus by a majority of the people there that the shot was fired from up the street. And I heard a shot, what sounded like a shot, from the left and behind me. 
near Pearl Street. And I immediately dropped to the ground, right? Because I just assumed all hell was going to break loose. There's lots of shots being fired. The shots don't seem real. That's what's funny. It just doesn't seem real. The police started shooting in. They started shooting tear gas into the, the uh, property. There was allegations that Move was in the basement shooting out. After a short period of shooting, Officer James Ramp was found fatally wounded. After exiting the house, all 12 Move adults were arrested, and the 11 Move children in the house were taken away from their parents by the police. Little by little, I think the women came out first, the women with the babies. But then I see Chucky Africa comes out, and he's shot, he's shot in his shoulder. And I'm rushing to go to him as a cop takes a gun and puts it to his head and pulls back the hammer. And I grab it and says, whoa, whoa, what are you doing here, right? There had been much concern on the part of many people that the police would make a violent assault on the MOVE members. As it turned out, the police acted with precision and restraint. Unfortunately for the police, the beating of Delbert Africa was caught on camera. I went to exit the basement after a cop stuck uh, his gun in the window and is plainly seen on the uh, later vi police videotape. And he told me, bring your black ass out here. I said, I'm going out the front. Come out this way, I'll blow your damn head off. Boom. <laughs> Obviously, uh, I came out that way. And the next thing I remember was being dragged across Pearl Street by my hair by some cop. I don't know who. Mm -hmm. And then when they dragged me, uh, got me up on the curb, uh, then a bunch of them just started kicking. Geist, Mulvihill, and Zagami were all brought up on charges of police brutality a few years later, but Judge Stanley Kubaki dismissed the case. Only two days ago, three of the officers charged in the beating surrendered to assault charges. That sparked a protest by 500 fellow officers pointing out they also wear blue. And the head of the police union gave his thoughts on those who beat Delbert Africa. What they should have done is shot that goddamn bum, and then there would have been no trouble today. Immediately after the August 8th incident, the police claimed that MOVE fired the first shot from MOVE headquarters. But it, it, they didn't have any proof that anybody shot out of the MOVE housing, but somebody shot and, and people started shooting. Television news reporters Richard Maloney and Larry Rosen claimed that they recalled hearing a shot on the opposite side of the street. It was my recollection that it, the shot came from behind because when the shot was fired, everybody turned this way. And uh, so they turned their focus away from the windows where the armed move members were, the basement windows where the armed move members were. A number of independent observers, those with the police as well as those not with the police, and journalists and others uh, have contended that the uh, first shot came from behind the assembled police officers and not, and not out of the basement of uh, the MOVE compound. The August 8th newspaper, this was like not even hours after uh, the police attack on MOVE and MOVE people being arrested. Front page of the Philadelphia Daily News. Oh my God, they shot a cop. Who shot a cop? <laughs> you know, I mean, there had been no trial. Move people hadn't even been processed on charges yet. And <clears throat> the news media on the front page of the newspaper had them tried and convicted. Oh my God, they shot a cop. That every step of the way, including the final act today, the police used commendable restraint, uh, and it was done for many reasons, uh, most of all because of the children who are present today. Uh, the police probably would have been their rights to have, subsequent to the shooting of Officer Ramp, stormed the house and killed all of the 12 people in that basement. On May 8, 1980, after 67 days of trial, Judge Edwin Malmed found Janine, Janet, Debbie, Merle, Chuck, Delbert, Mike, Edward, and Phil Africa guilty of third-degree murder, conspiracy, and multiple counts of attempted murder and aggravated assault. They are now known as the Move Nine. Each defendant received a sentence of 30 to 100 years. Look at this case and the facts in this case. 
there's no there's no evidence that there was a conspiracy to kill the cop, to kill the police officer. There was no evidence of that. Uh, the evidence that was put on at trial was that uh, there were individuals seen at the window with weapons, uh, firing those weapons. That's what the police officers testified to. And, uh, and they identified those individuals. However, the whole theory of the prosecution was that there was a conspiracy. And again, I would, it goes back to that original uh, bizarre theory, was, which is that there was a conspiracy that began 16, 15, 18 months before and, and traveled all the way through based on words that were set on a porch, uh, allegedly set on the porch by MOVE members about what they would do to protect themselves. And as a consequence, the judge bought into that theory. So his position was, you're, you're, you're going to trial as a group, you're going to get convicted as a group, you're going to be sentenced as a group. Essentially ignoring all the important constitutional safeguards that each individual should be tried on the facts as it applies to each individual. And each individual should be sentenced based on individual sentencing factors and not sentenced en masse as a group based on association or based on this this ridiculous ridiculous notion of conspiracy. The testimony said, for example, that the bullet came in the left side and went across the body to the right and down. The report said it comes in the right side and goes on. So the, you got a big problem with the authenticity, authenticity and thus validity of the, of the medical examiner's report. The prosecutor took out a pencil and erased items in the report that he didn't like and wrote it in right there in open court. Now, move is objecting, you know, objection, objection, you know, and the judge, judge was saying, sit down, shut up, you know, and allowed the guy to do that. When the nine move members were convicted of third degree murder and sentenced to 30 to 100 years of peace, uh, several days after that, Judge Edwin Malmet uh, was a guest on a local talk station. He was asked by a caller, who killed James Ram? Uh, Malmet's response was, I have absolutely no idea. I know what his response was. I know what the question was, because I was that caller. The, the judge's comment is telling. Um, the comment that you're referring to has been referred to frequently. And I think his point was, uh, they didn't prove to me that, in fact, any one of those individuals committed the crime. So I convicted them all as a group. Well, the only way he could have done that was based on that prosecution theory of conspiracy, which was... Um, yeah, a fiction, I mean, an absolute fiction, and, and one that was not supported in the law. After arresting uh, my sisters and brothers, city officials completely demolished MOVE headquarters, the scene of the crime, the place where MOVE people were supposed to have shot this cop to death from. Now, if you destroy the evidence, the scene of the crime, how can you then proceed with prosecuting somebody. They destroyed the whole crime scene, the entire crime scene, the house, the tree where they said the first bullet went into, the bullet that came out the cops, I mean everything. Rizzo and his people didn't want the evidence that he knocked down the trees, knocked down the house and everything and that was unusual because you should have an investigation to come in because we were able to see the trees and see the bullet the marks of bullets, you know, rico had ricocheted off the building. Essentially, I think what I was witness to was after the, after the the move members were taken away, the bulldozing, which was very astonishing to me that they could do something like that. From the time the last move member got out of the house until the time that the city brought a wrecking crane in to tear the, the property down because they allegedly were afraid that MOVE members would try to reoccupy the house. Now just th think about that for a minute. The police come in, secure the scene, they can maintain guard around the house, but they claim that they had to tear the house down to make sure that nobody would reoccupy the house because they were fearful that later that evening, MOVE members who weren't in the house and their sympathizers would try to reoccupy the property. Preposterous. All I know is there is destruction of the truth. And that was what I was eyewitness to. And it broke my heart because uh, this neighborhood is my life. These houses are something I've put my, I've risked my life and I've risked my everything to develop and to see a house which is irreplaceable, which is a home, which is beautiful, which is part of our neighborhood, which nobody can reproduce, be destroyed, broke my heart. How do nine people 
get uh, charged with and convicted of murder, of murdering one cop with one bullet. You know, they cannot even and have not even identified one person as firing a gun that killed policeman James Ramp, let alone nine. How do you keep nine people in prison for 100 years each for a crime that you can't prove that any one of the nine did? After the trial of the MOVE 9, a former MOVE member claimed to government officials that he had proof that MOVE members living in Rochester, New York, were running a gun and bomb making scheme. A supporter named Don Glassy, he had, he had got, he was weak for the, for the authorities and, and, and what he did was he turned like government witness and they conjured up a lot of, uh, you know, false information. Many MOVE members were arrested in Rochester but only John Africa and Alfonso Africa were brought up on charges. A trial called John Africa versus the System then took place in Philadelphia. After numerous days of trial, a jury of 12 found John Africa and Alfonso Africa not guilty. John Africa woke up, wiped his eyes, and he began a closing argument that was pro so profound, so clear, and so true that it rocked everybody in that courtroom. Jurors had tears in their eyes. So when, the, when they got the verdict, they read it out real triumphantly, like, not guilty, Your Honor. And then they, and, 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 and it was like repeated over and over again, like, not guilty. Like, like real, I mean, a strong, you know, a strong statement they was making. After the trial of the Move 9 and John Africa versus the system, several Move members moved to a row house on 6221 Osage Avenue in West Philadelphia. Here, Move kept up their work schedule, but their main focus became the search for justice of the Move 9. By the end of 1983, government officials on all levels had proved ineffective and unwilling to take any action in Move's struggle for the Move 9. The media at this point ignored the issue altogether. On December 25, 1983, Move ended the media blackout by setting up a loudspeaker on their house and urged neighbors to take action for the Move 9. Events on Osage Avenue started to um, mushroom. Move's efforts to get their members out became more shrill. They started uh, with verbal harangues of the neighbors, amplified harangues for the PA system that was on the roof. One of the findings of the Move Commission that was impaneled after the 1985 raid was that on um, December 25th, 1984, Move um, was on their loudspeaker haranguing neighbors by name for 27 hours straight. Of relevance, um, December 25th is Christmas. So these neighbors' Christmas was interrupted with this foolishness. The neighbors complained to city officials, they complained to the police, they complained to the FBI, they complained to the U.S. Attorney's Office. No one did anything. They subsequently complained to the governor of the state, Governor Thornburg. He initially did nothing. Then the neighbors said, well, look, if you won't take care of them, a couple of us are Vietnam War vets, we'll take care of this. We're not going to live in this chaos any longer. The governor, who is a Republican, said, well, I'll come in and take care of it. We can't have citizens being vigilantes. Then it became an embarrassment for the Democratic mayor of the city. So he decided that he was going to take action. This is one Wilson Good. Neighbors of MOVE complained about MOVE talking on a loudspeaker at all hours of the day and using profanity. 
Some neighbors also complained of foul smells coming from MOVE headquarters and stray animals under the care of MOVE. The fact is, as every neighbor on the block come, you know, complained about MOVE, since when did this government care about black people complaining about their neighbors? Since when? When did the FBI start getting involved in neighborhood disputes? Aware that the city would indeed try to silence MOVE's protest, MOVE began fortifying the house in preparation for another confrontation like the one on August 8, 1978. On May 11, 1985, Judge Lynn Abraham signed arrest warrants for Ramona, Conrad, Frank, and Teresa Africa on charges of disorderly conduct and terrorist threats. Wilson Good said, take care of this, but there's only two things that I want done. Number one, I don't want any police officers who were involved intimately in the 1978 shootout involved in this, and I don't want any of the MOVE kids in the house. I had to, I talked to, uh, at that time, now you have Mayor Good, Rizzo is gone and you have Mayor Good, and I talked to him about the possibility of going in to see if there's any way we could not to have this repeat of 78. And um, he said, no, we got it under control. Um, that's all right. On Monday, May 13th, 1985, police and firemen launched a full-scale military attack on the Move Row House. In a 90-minute period, the police department of Philadelphia fired 10 thousand rounds of ammunition of all types of uh, weaponry from 38 caliber revolvers all the way up to M60 machine guns which were you know big 30 caliber military machine guns they had an anti-tank gun they didn't use it um, M16s sniper rifles why would they have sniper why would they have telescopic sniper rifles with silencers on them? The explanation that was subsequently given in public is that we had sniper rifles because we wanted to silently shoot out the street lights such that it would be a dark scene. Well, you might have a silenced bullet hitting the light, but it would break and the glass would break in the street, so it would be noise. What are you doing? Well, there may be a reason for that, and I'll get to that in a minute. During the police attack on the MOVE household, police flooded the area with tear gas and shot over 10,000 rounds of ammunition at the MOVE house. When these tactics failed to bring MOVE out of their house, a helicopter was brought in, which dropped a bomb on the MOVE house. The bomb started a fire, which ended up burning 60 houses to the ground. We just reported that uh, Police Commissioner Gregory Sambor said that he ordered this so-called uh, concussion bomb to secure the building. Uh, could you explain exactly what that means and what Sambor intended to do? What does that word secure mean exactly? Well, I think that you would probably have to ask him that question to get a full explanation. My understanding about what he wanted to do was to remove the bunker from the top of the house. There was a tremendous amount of concern uh, that the bunker was constructed in a way that would uh, prevent the uh, officers from entering the building because there was always a possibility of someone hiding out in there and shooting. So there was an attempt all day long, first with water, uh, then uh, with other objects to try and remove the bunker. Uh, and apparently uh, the decision was made to try and, and try and explode it off in some way. Now, the reason given for dropping this bomb on the top of the house was to neutralize the bunker because they wanted to move, they had allowed MOVE to build a bunker, a pillbox, a reinforced uh, um, shooting tower, I mean shooting compartment on the top of their roof. So the plan, and, and this is why I tell you that the, you know, Greg Sambor was an absolute idiot, the police commissioner. His plan was to have police officers run across the roofs of the row home, punch a hole in the roof, and then dump tear gas down in the roof. Now, I just told you a minute ago, during the morning raid, they blew the whole front of the house off. 
so they could have went to the other side of the street with tear gas grenade guns and shot all the tear gas they wanted right into the front of the house. See, so the, the explanations and the common sense conclusion makes no sense. So what makes more sense is that they wanted to drop a bomb on that house and hurt those folks, including the kids in the house, that they knew were in the house, but the police commissioner says, I consider them combatants and not hostages of their parents. Once again, would a white police commissioner have considered white children as combatants? I would argue strenuously that that would never happen. But it happened here because they were black kids. So they dropped a bomb to neutralize the bunker and hopefully blow a hole in the roof. Now, they also knew from their aerial surveillance that there was a five gallon gas can on the roof. The bomb drops, it blows up, it lights up the gas can. So now we have a fire going on the roof. The police commissioner makes a tactical decision to let the fire burn. I'm referring to 1985, I was talking to a woman who actually, I won't identify, but who uh, is a lifelong Philadelphian. And I, uh, 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 once a friend of mine at, at that time, that period, and I said that the houses on Osage Street are a fire. I had just found out, and she said, good. So, there's a lot of racial hatred in this country, in this city, in this country, that we have never addressed, and that we don't, we don't, we, we, it's, it's the sin of America. We had a bomb dropped on us. We had thousands of rounds of bullets, 10,000 rounds of bullets fired on us. We were deluged with water. We were tear gassed. The bomb ignited a fire that the fire department stood there and refused to put out after putting water on our house for hours all that morning. And all of that, and we're violent. Could you tell us anything more than we already know about the number of casualties, the number of people who are still at large with guns? What is the latest status on this? Uh, we don't have any indication that anyone lost their life. That does not mean that we did not, uh, 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 in fact, end up with the loss of life, but I don't know of anyone at this point. Fire experts that were hired by the MOVE Commission said the temperatures in the house reached 2,000 degrees. You melt steel at 2,000 degrees, you know, at, in a steel mill. Some MOVE members tried to escape. They were driven back into the house by police gunfire. So maybe that's what the silenced sniper rifles, you know, sniper rifles with silencers on them were for. Um, the police claimed that they never shot anybody, that they never drove anybody back in. A couple of police officers broke ranks and said that they did. They were driven out of the police department. Civilian witnesses said that they did. They were ignored. The lone surviving MOVE member, Ramona Africa, said that they were shot at, as well as the kid but they were dismissed. The medical examiner found in the charred bones that they pulled out of the move house, 12 gauge buckshot from police shotguns. Now, if move members were inside the house, they could never have been shot with buckshot. Some people came out of the house, were shot, and limped back into the house and were subsequently burned up. Now the fire went out of control by the time they decided to start fighting the fire. It had, the whole block was consumed. Within hours, 61 homes were totally destroyed. 11 people in the move house were killed, including five children. And that's how May 13th, 1985 ended in a holocaust, in a catastrophe. And not a single police officer police department official, fire department official, or city official ever faced criminal charges for that. A bolt action rifle, two shotguns, and two revolvers were the only weapons found in the ashes of the move house. You know, they murdered our children. You know, Janine and Phil had two sons that was murdered. Consuela had two daughters that was murdered. Janet and Delbert had two daughters that was murdered. 
you know, Sue had her son murdered. And because of May 13th, 1985, I mean, this city was exposed terribly. I mean, how much more brutal can you get than having it in the newspaper, which is where I read about my son's death, that a police officer saw a pair of blue eyes staring up at him? I mean, they deliberately, deliberately set our kids a fire, you know, a blaze, burnt them alive, gave them no, no avenue of escape, and when they tried to escape, shot them down. Some pick a fight and call it bravery. I call it easily provoked. Them never conquer on that keep it cool. I feel the pressure, but I still don't choke. For when we fight fire with fire, what your get a pile of ash and the heat crack the cornerstone hey, but when we fight fire with water what your get to create a big splash and the heat disappeared and small yeah oh, oh. after the bombing ramona africa was sentenced to seven years with conspiracy to riot at ramona's trial lieutenant frank powell who dropped the bomb and officer william klein who assembled it pleaded the fifth Many investigations were done on the May 13, 1985 bombing of MOVE, but no indictments were ever made. Before the incident was swept under the rug of Philadelphia's history forever, Ramona Africa filed a civil suit against the city, and MOVE ended up receiving some compensation for the May 13 catastrophe. On March 13, 1998, MOVE was devastated to find that their sister Merle Africa had died at the State Correctional Institution in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania. The death came as a shock to Move, because the last they knew Merle was in good health. Move feels to this day that the death of Merle Africa is very suspicious. Move's major focus these days is finding justice for the Move 9 and Move supporter Mumi Abu Jamal, who are all currently incarcerated in the Pennsylvania prison system. Your name, sir, is Mike Africa from the Move organization. Now, I want to point out I got nine Move people sitting in prison right now doing 30 to 100 years for a crime they ain't commit, including my mother and my father. We got serious work to do. We ain't out here talking just to be talking. We putting out information. And what's the protest originally about? I mean, what were you protesting for? For the release of my mother and my father, and Mumia Abu Jamal, and Linda Peltier, and Russell Schultz, and all the rest of the political prisoners.
is probably one of the most important prosecutions in this in this city's history. So I find it a little strange that, that the tapes are missing uh, and are not available to the Commonwealth. Uh, not in some archive somewhere, I do. And find out. It's hard to explain. Postscript on this whole sad scenario and ordeal. The police department knows who killed Officer Rand. It was another police officer who inadvertently shot the guy. They have fairly substantial evidence that this that it was a mistake. But again, they'll never admit it. I got this uh, from a number of different sources in the police department, including uh, sources uh, on the SWAT team and sources in the ballistics. This goes out to everyone feeling the melody, feeling the music, being swept up by the energy. Say, can it be that we could become one, come to a better understanding for this night is done, yeah. This goes out to everyone living in poverty, living with unequal opportunities and inequality. It bothers me that while I simply sit, think it's gotta leave people slave away, or they just to try to make a dollar we Trying to follow the dream of those who started this colony, follow me. Just the color of a collar See, it's not an apology I won't oversimplify It's more than just a thought Cause we got to empathize And improvise new ways to change this system Survival of the fattest It's all capitalism Next time somebody has to change when you walk by I dare you take a second Just to look that man in the eye And ask why do I have the privilege to comply And is this guy sitting here Because he just didn't try I know I choose each day To question my immunity And show love to me Stay. 